Did you know Magic the Gathering was almost called Mana Clash? Creator Richard Garfield originally called the game Magic when it was being designed and tested. However, when it came to copywriting the title, Garfield was informed by a lawyer that Magic was far too broad a name to copyright. Naturally, Garfield began looking at alternatives and settled on the name Mana Clash. Despite this, everyone who played the game during its production continued to call it Magic. Garfield went back to the lawyer and asked what they could do to keep the name Magic. The lawyer told them they'd need to transform the word somehow to make it something unique and ownable. This is when The Gathering was added to the game's title. It was never intended for this extended title to stick, however. Garfield planned to update the name with every expansion that released. When the first Magic expansion Arabian Nights released, the title would have been updated to Magic Arabian Nights. This plan was abandoned because it would complicate the game's copyright situation, and players liked the initial name. This wasn't the only change that was planned for each expansion. Along with changing the name, the back of the cards was going to change as well. A new back was designed for Arabian Nights, but just before it was sent for printing, designer Scaff Elias convinced everyone to keep the original card backs. Elias has since joked this was his most important contribution to the franchise. Speaking of card backs, every Magic card has the text Deckmaster at the bottom. This is because Magic's publisher, Wizards of the Coast, planned on releasing a series of trading card games all under the brand Deckmaster. Other Wizards properties like Netrunner and Battletech used this branding. Even though the Deckmaster brand was shelved, the logo on the cards remained so that all Magic cards had identical backs. Another interesting fact about early Magic is that all the card flavor text for the Arabian Nights expansion was done in a single night. Beverly Marshall Sailing was the head editor at Wizards during the initial release and the first expansion. As Sailing was finishing up her final pass on Arabian Nights before it was sent for printing, she realized no one had picked any flavor text for the set. This meant that in a single night, Sailing had to go over two different Arabian Nights source material books, come up with the flavor text, and type it all up herself. There's been a few different experiments with Magic cards in the past. One unused idea was to include a scratch-off card in every booster pack. These were planned for the cancelled Unglued 2 set, where each scratch-off card would have three scratchable lines. Each time the player cast the card, they'd scratch off a line to reveal a new property. The art of the cards was also said to look like a scratch-off lottery ticket. Another unused idea was to put bubblegum in the booster packs. However, this idea was scrapped due to all the extra litigation that came with selling edible goods. Another promotional tactic used by Wizards was giving out Magic cards for free. In the early days of Magic, people who visited Wizards headquarters were given a starter deck and two booster packs whenever they walked through the front door. The receptionist at the time was asked to hand out the cards regardless of why visitors walked in. One visitor came in just to use the phone because their car broke down, and ended up walking away with $20 worth of Magic cards. The Magic cards themselves have some interesting stories behind them as well. Magic designer Mark Rosewater came up with a game mechanic in his sleep. When Rosewater turned in his initial design for the Mirrodin expansion, then-head designer Bill Rose felt it had too many mechanics. Rosewater was asked to remove one of his major new mechanics, as it drew too much focus. He was asked to add another smaller mechanic that could stand on its own. Rosewater only had a few weeks to fix the issues, and was struggling. One night closer to the deadline, Rosewater went to bed, as he normally would. He came up with a mechanic that solved the problems, and was ecstatic, until he realized that he was dreaming. Fortunately for Rosewater, he was able to wake up and write down the mechanic before he forgot. This mechanic was in Twine, where players are allowed to cast multiple properties of a spell if they pay a higher price, known as the Entwine cost. Sometimes there are miscommunications while making magic cards, such as the card Pyrotechnics. Wizards commissioned artist John Avon to make the card's art, and sent him the description, This spell generates a lightning bolt. Show it hitting a drake. John wasn't familiar with fantasy lore, and painted what he thought he'd been asked. When John turned his art in, it was of a lightning bolt hitting a flock of male ducks. 
drakes. In fantasy, a drake is essentially a dragon, but John didn't know this until after his first attempt. This isn't the only funny misunderstanding. In order to print magic in so many different languages, Wizards uses a large network of translators. These translators are very skilled, but every now and then, a mistake is made. The Japanese name for the card York Moth's Agenda was originally translated as York Moth's Day Planner. Luckily, someone realized the team had accidentally translated the wrong definition of agenda. Speaking of Japan, there was a Magic the Gathering video game released exclusively in the region for the Dreamcast. The game came out on June 28, 2001, and featured 10 exclusive cards that haven't been used since the game's release. Curiously, the game's UI features a mix of Japanese and English text, and whenever a voiceover is used, it's entirely in English. Another obscure Magic game is Magic the Gathering Armageddon. This title was produced by Acclaim in 1997, and was only released in arcades. The game was an unusual mix of strategy and fighting game, where two wizards summon various creatures to attack each other, with the last wizard standing winning the match. Players choose between one of five magical disciplines in the game, all represented by the colors red, white, blue, green, and black. Players control the game using buttons and a trackball, moving the cursor to target an opponent or an area on the playfield where they want to summon a creature. The longer the summon button is held, the more powerful the creature will be, but the player will also be vulnerable while summoning. As you might expect, this game is extremely rare. It never entered full production, and there are only four known arcade cabinets in collection circles. This is because Acclaim's coin-op division went out of business after the game could be entirely finished and published. The game was previewed in a handful of publications such as GamePro magazine. The game was not released for any home systems. The latest Magic game, Magic the Gathering Arena, was almost called Magic Multiverse. Magic Multiverse was the game's working title during much of the title's development. The name was changed fairly late into development, when the team decided Multiverse didn't give an accurate impression of what the game actually was. The title Arena was chosen to allude to the in-game battlefields, which tend to look like big arenas where magical battles take place. Another fact about Arena is that the title's game rules engine was actually built by rocket scientists. A group of rocket scientists from the technology company Foley were tasked with coming up with a set of rules that could read, analyze, and interpret magic cards for gameplay. The team spent years developing the game rules engine, which is now maintained by a dedicated rules team. This team has since analyzed and implemented thousands of different magic cards. This task isn't to be understated, as magic is a very complicated game with more than 2,000 rules and over 19,000 unique cards. A scientific study, as reported by Forbes, even suggested that magic is the most complex real-world game ever made. The eight-page scientific paper from MIT, titled Magic the Gathering is Turing Complete, tested the game on a computational level using a Turing machine. The results showed that optimal play in Magic is so difficult that computer algorithms are insufficient for figuring out the winner based on the cards played. Essentially, there are so many non-trivial decisions during a game of Magic that an algorithm isn't capable of determining a perfect strategy. This means Magic is more complex than other games like Jenga and Tetris, which can both be figured out by a computer algorithm. Magic the Gathering Arena's practice bot, known as Sparky, was originally made to test card interactions. Because Magic is the world's most complex game, developers weren't going to make AI bots that players could practice against. In order to save resources and headaches, only scripted AI would be used in a tutorial. However, gameplay testers needed a better automated way to test card interactions. So, the team made bots that could play cards against each other. Early on, these bots chose cards and options simply at random, and made mistakes such as countering their own spells. The test team kept adding more interactions and intelligence to the bots though, which refined them and made their test cases better. Eventually, the bots were smart enough to play a basic game of magic against players. The design team took those test bots and added even more personality and intelligence to them, creating the bot battles you see in the game today. Several of Arena's game modes also have interesting facts behind them. For example, the Momir game mode was created by a single programmer who just really liked Momir. Arena has many staple game modes from Magic to play, like Draft, Sealed, Pauper, and Singleton. 
but one of its wackier formats is Momir, where players are given a random creature each turn. The Momir game mode was created independently by one of the rule programmers, because he wanted to play the mode in Arena. After he showed it off to the team, they liked it enough that they took it and rolled it out to all players early in the beta. The same programmer who built this mode also started to do the same thing with the Brawl mode as a passion project. Unlike Momir mode, however, the rest of the team found out pretty quickly and jumped in to help finish off the mode. The project was codenamed Jazz internally and became the passion project of a number of studio members. If you're interested in jumping into Magic the Gathering, check the description below for a download link for Magic the Gathering Arena. Thanks again for Wizards of the Coast for sponsoring this video. And if you want more facts, check out our videos on Mario and Zelda rumors.